Okay, our next speaker is Luis uh, Caro Campos. Okay, so uh, Luis is going to tell us why we shouldn't uh, write our own C++ package manager. Perhaps he's going to promote Conan a little bit. <laughs> so thank you very much for being here, Luis. Thank Go you. ahead. Nice. So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. My, my name is Luis. Uh, I'm part of the uh, Conan team. And today I'm going to talk about uh, why you shouldn't write your own package manager, although maybe some of you will actually be encouraged to try it. So uh, I, hope, I hope that's the case. Um, Right, so very often we see messages like uh, on Reddit or Stack Overflow of people asking, uh, they're new to C++ and they've used other programming languages, and they ask, oh, what's the package management situation? Why doesn't it work like other languages or other package managers like NPM or PIP? Uh, and we see that a lot, to the point where people are actually bothered uh, when, when they actually uh, start, using, uh, start using C++. And I think, I mean, uh, a lot of you have a lot of experience with C++. I think we can all agree that this is not an easy task. Um, so I will talk about uh, that today. Um, but let's actually compare one of those other languages. This is a uh, Python script. It uses um, the URL library, right? This is one of the top three most downloaded libraries from, from PyPy, uh, as far as I can, I can see. And you, know, you may be in a virtual environment, and you invoke the pip package manager to, to install it. What this is going to do, at least for this library, there's a single package, regardless of the operating system, the version of Python that you're using, um, or the CPU architecture. So this is just going to download a single file. It's going to put it somewhere where the Python interpreter can find it, and then the script will be uh, able to run. Um, we can have a simple case in C++ as well, where we have a single header, header-only library in C++. The idea would be the same. That file is also uh, agnostic of architecture, or compiler, compiler version, operating system. So a C++ package manager, let's say we invoke it to install uh, this, this dependency, uh, you know, there's man the many options. The first thing that it has to resolve is how does it tell the compiler where to find that, right? Not all of these uh, alternatives that I'm listing here will result in the compiler finding uh, or being able to resolve that include, direct, um, include directive uh, there. So in this particular case, the linker is not involved. So that's why I'm saying this is a, this is a simple case. This is only resolved at, at compile time. But the example that I uh, show for, with Python earlier was very simple. It's a Python-only library. As some of you may know, Python has the ability to call C++, uh, C or C++ uh, uh, code if you're using the C Python interpreter. There's uh, multiple versions of the interpreter. So that complicates the package manager story uh, a little bit for Python. So let's say I try to install a different dependency. This one's called leaf. And now, depending on the C Python version, so the version of my interpreter, the operating system, and the version of the operating system, and the architecture, there's many variants. So that exposes the Python package manager to problems that are not related to Python at all, like uh, modeling the binary compatibility uh, in this particular case. And, you know, Python is also not straightforward when it comes to uh, package manager, as you may be, uh, be aware. So I always think it's funny when I see those messages that I, I showed earlier, that, oh, it's easier in different languages. I mean, the ecosystems, the second they have to be exposed to compile code from C and C++, um, the problems are actually uh, very, very similar. So I just, I just laugh sometimes when I see, um, when I see those comments. But what about binary libraries in C++? So we move away from uh, header-only libraries, and and now we have compiled uh, libraries. So we do have that problem. Depending on the operating system, the CPU architecture, the compiler, the compiler version, the C++ runtime, we're going to have for a library from the same source code, we could have many binary variants of, um, of you know, the compile library. So this is a simple thing where we have multiple operating systems or architectures or compiler, compiler versions. But also, there are some conventions. The build type is a convention of which compiler flags you pass to uh, model perhaps the level of optimization, some uh, compiler definitions that, that you pass. You know, this is, this is an example. So that sort of duplicates the story. Now we have uh, release binaries, and we can also have debug binaries for, for the same library. 
Another one is we could build them as static libraries or shared libraries. There's different reasons where you may go with one uh, or the other. Um, so now, again, we have even more, right? So the C++ um, package manager, and this, this is, let's say, uh, a, a generic one that we're trying to build from scratch, it has to be able to model binary variants. It has to perhaps uh, support multiple platforms, support or give the user the ability to use on a system multiple versions of the same library. Maybe version 1.0 of your application is using uh, OpenCV3, and then you want to use OpenCV4. How do you handle? How do you handle that? And some libraries have, and I didn't, I didn't uh, show it on the graph because it will be way too many, too many variants. Uh, optional features. You can build OpenCV with uh, video encoding support and without video encoding support. So that sort of means that in C++ at least, uh, traditionally, the possibilities are endless. Uh, the variability of these binaries can be arbitrarily uh, complex. And you know, we have a case where there may be newer versions of compilers or a new CPU architecture comes along, like when Apple uh, sort of introduced the ARM um, on, on the MacBooks, right? You want to be able to build this from scratch, which means that our C++ package manager now needs an interface to build, uh, sorry, to interact with the build systems of those libraries. And there's, as you may know, there's no universal build system in C++. I know uh, a lot of people are uh, envious of, of Rust and Cargo, but C++ doesn't have that. A lot of projects use CMake. A lot of projects still use auto tools as Messen. There's, um, there's many, many things to support. So if we want our C++ package manager to be able to generate these binary, binary variants from source, we have to interface with a lot of, um, a lot of stuff from like spans like three or four decades at this point. Um, but what about binary, binary compatibility? We may have, and, and this is a very uh, usual case, we have our application, we're building it uh, in debug mode because we want to you know, run the debugger, uh, troubleshoot something, and our application has dependencies. What configuration do you want your dependencies to be built with, right? This is, and we, let's say, as I showed earlier, we have different binary variants. Perhaps you want your uh, dependencies to also be built exactly with the same compiler and, um, and build type as your own application. But also, at least uh, on Linux, um, binaries built with release or built with an earlier version of the compiler on the same system, I mean, obviously those are variables, are going to be, are going to be compatible, right? So which ones do we choose? And here is where like, there's no agreement actually. Some people say, I want all my dependencies to be in release because I only care about debugging my code and also performance. If I build OpenCV in, uh, in debug mode, it's going to be so slow that I will not be able to do anything. Whereas other people or other developers, they want everything to be uh, built in debug mode with exactly the same flags, right? Um, so there's really no universal uh, agreement on this. So a C++ package manager actually has to support both. Um, at least uh, from what we've seen and we get uh, our users uh, requesting. In some cases, especially uh, on the case on the right, it may be a requirement. Maybe the, uh, the build type that you're using is uh, you know, the address sanitizer or the threat sanitizer. And if you read the documentation of those, they said you will catch more um, issues if you build everything with instrumentation. So that capability uh, needs, to, needs to be there. What about usage requirements? When Consuming the libraries, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, the package manager needs to sort of propagate or cause the build system to pass the right uh, flags. There's going to be sort of three, three stages. We have obviously when we invoke the compiler, and this is mainly going to be the compile flags, perhaps the include paths or with some defines that we have to pass to the compiler to consume the libraries. The link flags, we need to tell linker um, which libraries we're linking, where to find them, and also the runtime linker, we need to like, at least it needs to be able to find the shared libraries that the, the executables uh, need to run. Um, here's, here's an example. We have a consumer application. This is our executable. It depends on library foo, which is a static library, and library foo itself depends on library bar, right? So in order to, uh, at link time, obviously because foo and bar are static libraries, the linker is not really involved, only the, the archiver. But when we link our executable, we need to tell the, um, the linker, hey, you need to link against lib foo, lib bar, and this is where you find, find those two. And at runtime, there is nothing to find, at least for lib foo and lib bar, because they're statically linked into the um, executable. 
But now, what if both are shared libraries? Now the situation, the situation changes. Uh, in this case, let's assume that libbar doesn't have any other dependencies, so the linker is not going to link any additional dependencies. When we create libfoo, we need to tell the linker link against libbar, and this is where you find it. And then when we link our application, we need to tell the linker, hey, you need to link against libfoo, and this is where you find it. And also, if we're on Linux, we need to tell the linker where to find libbar as well, because it's going to uh, actually want to, want to check that. And then at runtime, it's going to have to find both because they're both share, share libraries. Um, but what about this, this other situation as well, where libfoo is a shared library and libbar is a, is a static, static library. So obviously libbar is a static library, the linker is not, not involved. Libfoo needs to, um, we need to tell the linker where to find libbar, and, um, sorry, to link against libbar and where to find it. And the consumer application, it's only aware of libfoo, so it needs to link against that one. And at runtime, we only need to locate libfoo. So this is an example of how the sort of build script for this particular um, application that depends on libfoo, that depends on libbar, may look like. Let's say it's a simple um, executable, and we're using CMake, and we tell, you know, you link against libfoo. What I've shown you in the previous, like, four slides is that the consumer may have these two lines, but the flags that are eventually passed to the linker will be completely different depending on how libfoo and libbar were, um, were generated. So there needs to be some logic somewhere that depending on those configurations, does it translate it into the correct, uh, correct flags. In the past, a lot of the logic was in the build scripts of the consumer. Now, over the next, uh, over the uh, previous, I don't know, maybe five, uh, six years, especially of modern CMake uh, is uh, gaining traction, that logic is moving away from the local build, um, build scripts into either the package manager or other solutions. So you could argue, well, you know what? If you build everything with CMake, the generated CMake files are going to contain this information in one way or the other, and CMake will be able to derive the correct um, flags. But typically, we could have, you know, we could be using CMake on a consumer application. Maybe libfoo is built with autotools and libbar is built with Messen and they're not going to be generated as CMake files with that additional information. So this is where the package manager could have this information and actually help um, the, cons the final consumer uh, have the right information. What we don't want is the consumer to have to sort of query the libraries to see whether one is shared, one is static, and, and, and conditionally pass flags depending on, on one or the other. So this interface is actually really good um, in, that, in that sense. But what about... Um, a slight variation on, on, on what we saw what we saw earlier, um, where libfoo is shared and libbar um, is static. When we generate libfoo, we link against libbar. But now the consumer also depends on, on libbar, and libbar is static. So the consumer is also going to link against uh, libbar, and the at runtime is going to be the same. We only need to find libfoo. But what can happen is that both the consumer executable and libfoo are going to contain symbols from libbar, which could be a problem uh, in two situations. If the versions used in either were different, because now you could have ODR violations where the um, definitions are, are different, or if there's any global state that um, is going to be altered by one, one or the other uh, when the application starts, and it could just trample on, on itself at, at runtime. Problems caused by this, they can uh, happen at uh, compile time, at link time, and at runtime, you never know. So you really want uh, your package manager to try to either, you know, fail early rather than leave it to chance to happen somewhere else down the line, or just remove the possibility of this happening altogether. Now, in my experience, a great number of compiling your errors, especially that people report on uh, Stack Overflow, for instance, they have to do with how the dependencies are managed. They're not nothing to do with, with your own code, maybe to do with your own build system, depending on what, you, what you're doing. Um, but here's where, in, in my opinion, there's a, a lot of problems. Is like there's not really good um, error messaging to, to the uh, users. It happens way too late in the pipeline, and and that's a that's a problem. So now we have uh, more features to add to our C++ package manager. We want to resolve binary compatibility, perhaps based on the user's preference, because everybody, everybody has uh, different, different opinions or different, different needs. It's very important for the package manager to help the build system 
to derive the correct flags to the, to the compiler and linker. Maybe be aware of whether libraries or static libraries are being embedded into multiple places in the same sort of dependency graph. Support multiple build systems, you're going to see that a lot um, because that's, um, that's our bread and butter. And then one of the last things I wanted to talk about is how to locate shared libraries at runtime. So, you know, maybe we compile uh, successfully, maybe we link successfully, and we could say we built our program, right? But it doesn't end there. We actually have to run it, and hopefully you have tests at the very least that you have to run to verify that everything uh, everything's working, everything's working correctly. But then we may see something like this, right? So how do we tell the runtime linker or dynamic linker, hey, this is where you find this is where you find the libraries? You know, uh, he, here's the frustrations that, that can happen with that. Um, other things that could happen is that it loads the libraries, but it loads the wrong version. It doesn't load the one that it was linked with at build time. It loads some <coughs> other library that it found elsewhere in the systems, for for example. So on Linux, Mac OS is slightly different, but very similar, and, and other um, similar Unix-based systems. There are predetermined system locations where the uh, runtime linker is going to, to be uh, looking for libraries. We do have environment variables that we can um, fill with data so that the uh, runtime linker looks there. There's also approaches with uh, data embedded in the libraries or executables themselves as to where to look. It could be uh, absolute paths or relative to the location of the um, executables or libraries. There's other approaches. I'm, I'm sure if you've installed CUDA on a Linux machine, you will see that it modifies your ld.com so that it can find the CUDA libraries in, in some arbitrary location on your system. Windows. It could be simpler or more complicated, depending on how you look at it. Um, in, some, in a lot of cases, it will look uh, rel relative to the executable. So a lot of people will choose to put the DLLs right next to the executable. Or you can define the path environment variable, and it will also uh, load it from there. Although, obviously, you have to be careful that it finds the right ones in the, in, in the right location first. And obviously, some system locations in, in the Windows uh, system directory. So here, we have multiple things uh, at play. Um, relocatability, a lot of systems, especially in Linux systems, simplify the problem by assuming that everything will be installed in a fixed location in your system, regardless of whose system uh, it is, which enters in contention, in contention with the ability to, ha to have multiple versions um, of the same dependency. Um, maybe you are testing OpenCV with and without FFmpeg, and, and you want to have a, a look at how that works. Um, the ability to write system locations, especially on Mac OS, you're not even allowed to add, um, modify those, those locations. So you're going to have to find a different alternative. And we need to distinguish some things like you may want to run these executables during your development workflow. You, you're running your test, you run your debugger, or we may be talking about um, distribution to the end user altogether. So the consumer of these binaries is not a developer, is the end user of the application, perhaps. So all of those things are um, different. And this, I'm going to summarize like three approaches that, that we see. One of them um, is environment variables, right? All three systems, Linux, Macros, and Windows, and, and the linkers there, you can define environment var variables to tell the linker where to find, where to find the libraries. It's easy. So you would have your package manager, at least it should be able to set up the environment for that, for that to happen, which actually works really well if you're on the command line. And it works very similar to, say, a virtual environment um, on Python, for instance. But if you're using an IDE on a Mac OS, when you launch uh, an, an IDE, sorry, uh, a graphical user interface application, it's not going to be picking up the environment variables from your terminal. So that's, uh, that complicates the story. But this actually works really well, uh, especially uh, on command line. Another approach is the top level executable. You have the ability, and, and you say, you know, this is my local development executable. You modify that to uh, tell it. Um, the runtime path, the locations of where to locate the, the libraries. So this avoids the problem of uh, environment variables of, or together. And this is how CMate works when you build something locally, not for um, distribution, but locally for, for development. Is like CMake knows where the, uh, the libraries were at CMake configuration time and at link time, and it will embed those paths into everything it generates such that the runtime linker can, can find that. that also works uh, really well, although your mileage may vary depending on, on the behavior of your Linux linker uh, for other things that you can come ask me after this uh, uh, 
the coffee time. Or you may actually choose, you know what, I'm not going to be fast with uh, telling the linker either via R paths or environment variables where to find the libraries. I'm going to write in those locations. And what if you're not allowed to run those locations? I'm going to lie, lie to the process. I'm going to use Linux kernel capabilities to expose a different file system to the whole um, processes that I want to run. And while I'm at it, I'm just going to throw an entire, entire Linux distro file system. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with using Docker to Dockerize absolutely everything just to run this, this thing and, and uh, bypass all those limitations of I'm on Linux, everything is in the system folder. I want to test a different version. So to me, this is too big a hammer, but if you're only developing on, developing on Linux, it may actually, may actually work. So we have even, even more capabilities to add to our C++ package manager. We need to help the runtime linker locate libraries. Um, we may or may not want our binaries to be relocatable. Maybe you're using CI and maybe your CI is using a, a custom workspace to um, generate these binaries and you want to distribute those users in binaries to use it across different developing machines. And you don't have the luxury of ensuring that the path that existed in the build machine is also the same path that your developers are using. So that's something that um, developers want. And especially, and that's a lot easier to do on, on Windows, but on Linux is actually um, a lot more complicated, uh, or rather enters in contention with uh, the expectations of, of the user. But there's more. Obviously, this is a short talk. Uh, I'm not going to talk about these other things, but there's binary caching, right? Once you generated um, those binary variants from, from those libraries, you may want to, like, you definitely want to uh, cache them locally, um, but also remotely as well. You may want to, the ability to host packages and distribute them either maybe to other developers uh, in your team or uh, to the outside world. Cross-build is support. This is something that we got a lot of requests uh, for to, to support. So this is just more. And maybe, oh, I want to be able to list my project dependencies in a file. Some people want to express fixed versions and anything outside of those versions is not tested and not supported, but where some people are going to want to use uh, version ranges. That's the challenge, right? And um, obviously, we have attempted to tackle that problem, and, and we get a lot of feedback from, uh, from users uh, in, in this regard. So hopefully, this has motivated you to actually want to learn more about C++ Package Manager, try, uh, try them out, or, or maybe you want to write your own. Who knows? I ho hopefully, you're not discouraged. So thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, questions? Uh, first of all, great talk. And I Thank have you. one question. There is a bunch of projects which are based on the build-back system. They are you building kind of Linux uh, custom distribution and then C++ code is one of the main pro programming language for the applications of those. And the question here is because the build-back itself is a kind of the fixes those dependencies. So is there a place for the Conan in such project? Do you recommend it or did you saw, saw any projects uh, like this? Can you when they again introduced which, which system? the Conan manager between the Bitbake, which is the kind of Linux, uh, uh, the system for building the custom Linux distribution, and the CMake. So this Bitbake is calling, is setting up dependencies and calling the CMake. And my question is, uh, did, you, did you saw any kind of implementation like this when they introduced this Conan to the uh -huh. I, I couldn't hear very well the name of the of the tool. Sorry, uh, it's the tool called Bitbag. It's uh, used for build the custom Linux distribution based on Yocto. I mean, if you are not aware, I of see. It, no, Yocto, Yocto. Yes, uh, yes, we are. So there are ways of uh, integrating this. So where Conan sort of shines is generating files for the build systems to consume, to let them know where the dependencies uh, come from. There are some systems that, uh, if if we take those uh, those little circles. Um, I would say that very few uh, package managers will actually tackle all those things. So Linux itself, uh, maybe uh, the app get manager on, on Ubuntu or Debian, for instance, they make some compromises. It's not cross-platform, for instance. So you like not all of them choose choose the same uh, circles. But we have seen users, and we do have some proof of concepts of um, users trying to integrate to Yocto, and that's something that we're looking to to tackle later this year as well to sort of resume that uh, to guide users into integrating integrating that as well. But 
the idea is that we want to decouple the actual build systems from, from the package management. And it's sometimes it's a challenge because uh, the dependency management is really, really tightly coupled with the uh, uh, specific um, user scripts for, for the build systems. So over time, we're seeing better practices out there, but it's definitely definitely a challenge. But come talk to me in the coffee, and then we can talk uh, more about this. And, and my second question, thank you for this answer, would be, uh, I saw a project where they introduced the Conan because the it was hard to manage the dependencies, mm -hmm. which were stored, everything was stored locally, but the CMAKs were super complicated due to this fact. And uh, we achieved this simplicity, but then there was a kind of um, endless discussion how far to extract details from CMake to Conan, uh, to Conan files itself. And I wanted to ask what are the kind of, in short, good practices of it, when to stop extracting the details from the CMake files to the Conan files? Um, so the best approach would be to use the CMake targets as an interface between your code and, and your build scripts and the libraries that you're consuming, right? What differs is how those targets are defined and who defines them. So um, obviously you can, as, as you mentioned, you can choose to build it all as part of your project, which will complicate the story because now you have to be aware of building code that is not yours and you have to bring it in, it, it makes it harder. You can choose to like offload all of that to a system package manager, uh, which may, you may lose some control of which versions are, are supported. So I would say, the bander is exactly that. The fine package using modern CMake and using modern targets. And hopefully that will actually make your build system even more agnostic to what solution you're using. No worries. Um, over here. Uh, so you quickly mentioned already that PIP, Pipe and several, uh, similar package managers are also used for distributions for end users to use it. Mm -hmm. Is that also a vision you have for Conan or is it more developer centric? Because there's already a big ecosystem like all the Linux package managers, uh, Snap, Flatpak and so on. Or is there a goal to f that, that once you have the Conan uh, thing set up that for the end user, it turns out that there's just this one button to be pressed and you have snap, flat pack, whatever come out of it? Correct. So uh, in Conan 2, we've introduced a new feature called the deploys feature where you can actually generate uh, a self-contained or fully contained rather, you could call it distribution maybe, or it could be a folder, right? Of all the contents of the packages. So typically Conan works in a way that all the files stay in a Conan cache and then it generates uh, files to integrate your build system um, to find those in those locations, right? But in Conan 2, we have the option where you can create your custom deployers to, with you know, your own rules, uh, maybe make a, a distribution that doesn't require Conan to be consumed. So that feature is, is, is there, um, and we're just sort of in, in wait and see mode to see what uh, features people request and, and what conventions and what, what things, how they're going to use it, really. Okay, thank you. Any other question? I don't see any, so looks like you want coffee. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you.